Um, thank you so much for having me today. This lightning talk was part of um, IARPIC science communications workshop slash course that was run by Jessica Rhodes this past semester. Um, and I just wanted to take a couple minutes today to talk to you about uh, capacity, specifically research capacity in the context of Northern sustainable development. So we all know about sustainability and how uh, we look to the intersection between economy, society and the biosphere. And these have really become concepts that have become central to regional development. Um, my particular focus is on the context of sustainable development and environmental, uh, sorry, environmental governance in the Canadian North specifically. Um, part of the regional development plans for the Canadian North have focused on processes like environmental impact assessment. Um, which really depend on the interaction and collaboration between several different groups. So for example, on the right here, you can see a map of the traditional territories of Yukon First Nations. We have 14 different First Nations that are um, interacting and collaborating with the territorial government, the government, industry, academia, and also the public at large. And so we have a lot of interconnections and interactions happening kind of concurrently. As part of that, they're also working towards this kind of collective vision of sustainable development. Unfortunately, sometimes their ability to uh, interact with the process and participate in the process fully is, full, is dependent on their capacity to actually participate. And this is not always equal, which means that sometimes the decisions that get made towards sustainable development can be lopsided, which means not fully addressing everybody's concerns all the time. And so the obvious solution would be to build more capacity, which is a pretty, seems like a simple solution. But before we can really build anything, there's a couple of obstacles that we need to overcome. My PhD work, fo work focuses on these obstacles to a certain extent with some specific contextual aspects. The first obstacle that I look at is that the definition of capacity is something that still gets discussed both in development literature, uh, international development literature, sustainable development literature, but also gray literature. So in the Canadian North, there's been ongoing calls for Northern capacity building, but very little agreement on what kind of capacity, how it's meant to be built, and whose capacity should be built. So I, I focus on research capacity, which I choose to define as the ability of an actor, organization, or network to engage, produce, maintain, and use knowledge through individual and collective development. And so this intersects nicely with what uh, you folks are talking about in Davos. The second major obstacle that I see is that the role of research capacity in these particular processes, such as env environmental impact assessment, haven't been fully explored. So there's an unclear picture as to what the best approach is towards building that capacity, whose capacity, and how it should be built. So I wanted to step back for a second and kind of unpack that concept of capacity a little bit. I like to use the example of this guy who is building a table. He has a vision of what the table should look like. He has a plan for how he's going to get to that vision. But at the same time, he also needs to know uh, what materials he needs, what tools he needs, and then he also needs to know how to work with those tools and materials. This can be thought of as uh, competency or skill. And so there is one kind of aspect of capacity that is distinct from, say, the access to the tools and materials, which we think of as capability, or the resources in order to actually uh, fulfill the vision that you're trying to work towards. A great example within this example is that um, in this particular picture, he's using a hammer and a nail. Well, first he needs uh, a hammer and he needs to know that the hammer is actually the most efficient tool for hammering. If he tries to use a screwdriver, he could also make that work, but it wouldn't be as efficient and as um, well pleasant of an experience for him. Uh, speaking from a personal experience as well. The other thought is that uh, capacities are also interacting inter and interlinked. So for example, governance capacity, which is the ability to make 
collective decisions benefits from research capacity, which is finding the right tools and knowledge and having access to that, but also having the ability to use that knowledge. So you folks just uh, are about to discuss um, the outcomes of the Observing Summit in Davos. And it was my understanding that you kind of discussed these main themes. And I thought for a second we could look at it in terms of a capacity lens, or first of all, a competency and capability lens. From my perspective, I can see that these themes um, are directly trying to address some competency and capability uh, gaps that may be uh, existing right now in, in terms of the observing system. For example, the data management uh, line item, second to the bottom there, is both a competency and a capacity because you need the infrastructure to be able to store and maintain data, but you also need the training and people who are able to maintain that storage facility. So there is a bit of a, um, a combination between the two that needs to happen. In a similar light, but also in a different light, these different competencies and capacity or competencies and capabilities can be thought of as capacities in their own right. If we look back to the data management, we can see that that can be considered research capacity as a whole. So as you move forward in your discussions, I would encourage you to kind of think about um, not only how you need both money and training, but you also need money and training at different levels. So you need it for researchers, but if you're involving communities, you also need to think about these components at the community level, making sure they have enough people, enough people with training, enough people with access to the different kinds of knowledge that you need to make an efficient and, um, an efficient and successful network. Um, one of my favorite quotes that I've found is that capacity building kind of occupies this netherworld between individual training and national development. And so there's a scalar thinking that needs to come into any planning in order for it to be successful. Uh, and with that, I'd really like to thank you for your attention and for the opportunity to speak to you and for the opportunity to participate in the science communications uh, course. Thanks so much. Great. Thanks so much, um, Sam. And I'll ask maybe uh, just we have a, a question or two if anybody has. Uh, for Sam, we can do that, and then uh, any others we can keep until the, the broader discussion. Okay. Well, let's, if you do have anything that you'd like to ask Sam, I believe she'll be staying on the call, so we can do that during the broader discussion. Um, now I just open up the floor. Uh, at this point in time, we do a general um, member update. So this doesn't necessarily have to be related to the Arctic Observing Summit, can be anything related to Arctic Observing or, or data. Um, if people have any sort of updates, activities that they're working on or, or other things, just a, a short, uh, maybe 30 second or one minute update. Peter, this is Roberto. I have a quick update. Great, thanks, Roberto. So um, basically, the IRPIC is seeking comment uh, from the public on newly revised principles for conducting research in the Arctic. Some of you may have seen a request for comment earlier in the year. Uh, this is a second one that lasts until September 4th uh, based on massive input from stakeholders, researchers, community members, and federal partners um, that has led to substantial significant revisions. Um, the core principles include being accountable, uh, establishing com effective communication, respecting local culture and knowledge, building sustaining relationships, pursuing responsible environmental stewardship, um, and basically serve as guidance uh, and approaches that researchers are encouraged to adopt uh, across all stages of their, their, their activities. Um, so um, the period is, uh, for comment is open until September 4th. There are multiple ways. I'll add a link on the chat box. Oh, Mary, there's just did that, I believe, um, and basically, you know, find the best way for you. There is an email alias, IRPIC principles at nsf.gov. There's a Facebook page. There's the IRPIC collaborations page that will register notice. Several upcoming meetings, including the Alaska Eskimo Whaling Commission, where we'll have representatives take input. Uh, also, the UIC Science Day in early August. Or you can always reach out directly to me, and I'll provide my email, or uh, Renee Crane, who is the co-lead on this principles revision working group. So. Please, uh, please take a look at those and uh, provide your input and share them widely as well. Thank you.
Great. Thanks very much, Roberto. And um, all of that information will be recorded um, on the event site uh, on the IARPIC collaborations page um, that we'll update after the call. Any other updates? Peter, it's Martin. Martin Jeffers. Martin, go ahead, please. Uh, very quickly, um, earlier in July, I posted to IARPIC collaborations an announcement about the Office of Naval Research Young Investigator Program. Um, I've, I seem to recall the deadline for submission of proposals is the end of August, so it's not a lot of time. The organization was very late getting the announcement out, but it is a very good opportunity for those who received their PhD during roughly the last seven years. Anyway, if you need more information, uh, go to IARPIC Collaborations and just do a search for Young Investigator Program or YIP, yep, and uh, you'll find more information and um, a link to the full announcement where you find all the nitty gritty details about eligibility and um, how to write, how to apply, write your proposal, etc. And if anyone would like to talk to me about any particular ideas they have regarding the Arctic, because that's what I do at ONR, is help run the Arctic and Global Prediction Program, I'd be very happy to talk to any eligible young investigators. That's all. Thanks, Peter. Great. Thank you for that, Martin. And again, that'll be documented as well. Any other updates? Okay, well, we'll leave it there. And if we do have time and people think of something, we can try and come back to that later. Um, so with that, I'm going to uh, move on to agenda item three and uh, the lightning readouts from the Arctic Observing Summit. And we'll start off with the benefit, benefits frameworks grouping, uh, working group. Sorry, and I don't have the uh, person who's reporting on that, but I assume you know who you are. So if you could um, start with your lightning talk. I think that's me, unless Sam has miraculously joined the call. Sam, are you on the call? It doesn't look like Sam is on the call. Okay, um, sorry everyone. I was asked at the very last minute if I could do a readout. And um, unfortunately, I was not a rapporteur and was not um, actually in the entirety of this working group. But so what I'll do instead of really giving a, a formal readout is just to share um, a general sense of, of what we discussed. Um, and then I think Sandy can probably point people towards additional resources if you have um, interest in further clarification or further detail. So Noor, just before you continue, can you just uh, introduce yourself for people on the call? I will. Thank you, Peter. Uh, my name is Noor Johnson, and I am a research scientist with um, the National Snow and Ice Data Center at the University of Colorado Boulder. So, and I, I had the pleasure of participating in working group one with the Arctic Observing Summit. And our group was looking at societal benefits over the short, medium, and long-term perspectives. And we had, in particular, some contributions um, and sharing of examples from groups who have been looking at strategies and examples for observations that are guided by assessment, prioritization frameworks, um, and in particular, we had presentations that were linked to um, the uh, use of value tree analysis and intervention logic, um, linking to the Sendai framework, and then several that looked at the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And so we had, in particular, um, a lot of discussion and sharing from the WMO, and they talked, um, they, they brought in um, someone to share, in particular, the example of the, the polar view application as something where a fair amount of effort has been invested in um, linking observations and making them shareable and relevant down to the community level. So working with indigenous communities, in particular in um, Greenland and in Canada. And then we had as well a fair amount of discussion about the 
the IMOBAR project, which is um, shorthand for impact assessment on a long-term investment on Arctic observations. And this was a study that the European Commission funded that used um, the value tree framework methodology as well as intervention logic. And it was a very large study. They, had, they actually had 10 case studies and they developed value trees for all of them. And so our group spent a fair amount of time learning about that approach. And um, I think that was sort of held up as an example of a particular effort to understand um, and document and to a certain extent quantify the societal benefits of Arctic observing. And then we had some discussion about the, the sustainable development goals. Um, this was a discussion that looked at the relevance of the sustainable development goals for the Arctic context, in particular in linking indicators and thinking about um, some of the work that's been done under the SDGs on, on indicator development and whether the SDGs might be a useful framework for thinking about and evaluating societal uh, and measuring and evaluating societal impact of observations. And then we had, um, interestingly, I think we had about 20 people pretty consistently in this group, and it was a mix of natural and social sciences, but a lot of um, social science backgrounds and a lot of projects that were looking um, at the, um, I mentioned just a few in terms of thinking about quantifying or evaluating the societal benefits, but others as well that were looking at legal frameworks. Um, so there was a project on sustainability and looking at Russian legal frameworks for sustainability. We had um, a project the, that was also based in Russia looking at, it was called the Basin Concept. So it was an integrated approach to finding consensus between natural and social sciences, um, looking in particular at at um, Arctic Ocean levels, um, seas, and freshwater resources. So we spent most of our time, at least over the first um, day and a half, learning from these different project examples. And um, I think <laughs> um, we, we then had some presentations that were a little bit more general that we're thinking about. Um, we had a, I, I contributed a presentation on behalf of a group um, that had, had come from several workshops on community-based monitoring infrastructures that were held in North America and thinking about the societal benefits and how um, the need to support different kinds of approaches to infrastructure development in order to maximize societal benefits. Um, and then we also had a, a contribution from the Inuit Circumpolar Council and the work that they have done. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm just looking for this. Um, the notes from that particular piece, but um, the work that they have done um, in the um, the, Poli the Northwater Polynya, um, it's the Pikiala Sorsuak Commission, and the work that that commission has done to try to move move towards a community led um, observation framework for evaluating impacts of that um, conservation initiative. So I. Um, what I can't really report on is um, what was what came out of this working group and what fed into the final product of the AOS. And I know um, Hayo Eichen is on the call. He may be able to speak to that or others may be able to speak to that. But I, I think that the, um, the main point that uh, we were discussing was just the importance of continuing to invest in um, these different kinds of approaches to really understand and deepen and, and monitor and evaluate the societal benefits and societal impacts. Um, so wanting to work with the large initiatives that have already been developed, but also encourage other efforts and other methodological approaches to understanding societal benefit. So that's what I, that's, that's what I can offer from my impressions of that group. Great, thank Great, you, Noah. Um, what I'll ask well, is that people that's store their questions, their questions and save them, and we'll bring them all forward at the uh, the broader discussion period um, after the, after the um, reports. Um, so with that, I'm going to invite Alice Bradley of Williams College to uh, report on um, working group two. Thanks. Um, and I'm going to see if I could share my screen briefly. Um, but I seem to have lost that menu bar. 
It, um, it should pop up if you move your mouse towards the bottom of the screen. Uh, there we go. Thanks. Okay. Um, so, well, that's moving up. Um, so the theme two um, was, was the optimization of observing system theme. Um, and the kind of overarching goal for the group was to look at the concept of optimizing observing systems within the framework of linking um, societal benefit areas and users um, through kind of the hierarchy of the observing system down to individual sensors and types of sensors and networks. Um, and so, so we kind of went into the AOS with that overarching goal in mind and some develop or kind of sketched out approaches for how you might go about making these linkages. Um, and so what I've shared here um, is a figure that Sandy put together um, that is uh, identifying kind of the societal benefit areas, um, applications, application products, uh, individual parameters or phenomena um, or variables, um, synthetic products, and then actual observing systems and individual sensor level. Um, and the idea was that you can approach different problems and different parts of understanding the Arctic climate system and, and the Arctic system generally um, through this framework by starting at various places in this table. Um, so in this example that was looking at sea ice forecasting, um, they really started with this central application product and worked and built out the framework from there. Um, and so for the AOS, we looked at kind of this structural example um, in a couple different cases, looking at first the sea ice forecasting approach. Um, we tried one that was starting with the observing system end with the idea of coastal webcams and building it out uh, or sort of upwards through this chain. Um, and then also looked at permafrost characterization and benthic abundance in this context to try and identify what areas um, needed to be explored more in order to be able to make real gains towards actual optimization of observing systems altogether. Um, and it became very clear early on uh, that if you start this analysis in different places, you end up with different problems in different areas that you kind of get stuck on. Um, whereas if you start at the very low level, all of a sudden you're ballooning to a truly massive amount of areas um, between parameters and then the application products. This layer is where you tend to balloon a lot uh, in terms of what things, you know, you have one measurement and what it can be applicable towards. Um, and as we got into the discussion parts of the observing summit, I, it became very clear that moving back and forth between this kind of application product level and the um, observing products level, that pathway um, was very hard for people to wrap their heads around, mostly because we really have no idea what's there. Um, and so one of the key areas that came out, um, both in discussions and then we had a session that was um, primarily being or primarily presentations by representatives from private industry um, was that there is a really substantial need in the Arctic observing community to actually know and understand what is out there. Um, and, and so the um, kind of a proposal might be too strong a word, but the suggestion that, that came out um, into our final presentation um, was to uh, figure out a way to start doing um, some sort of capability assessment or knowledge map um, to develop a sort of census and inventory of the different observing systems, the different capabilities for observing that exist um, within the broader Arctic observing community. Um, recognizing that this necessarily has to be very broad because every system is interconnected. Um, we need to include both social and physical sciences. Um, we need to absolutely make sure that there is indigenous knowledge represented at the table and make sure that they're representatives of the indigenous communities. Um, and so what, what was discussed during um, the working group meeting um, was that this, at least initially, could be a project on the scale of you know, five to 10 people over a number of years to start this community census um, and kind of gathering all this information to be able to develop these knowledge maps and start identifying where there are gaps and where there are opportunities for optimization. Um, very much related to this was uh, making sure that um, uh, data accessibility and kind of discoverability is, is part of it so that as 
projects are identified or data sets are identified that are relative irrelevant to these efforts um, that everything is mapped in um, and that one of the major outcomes of this would be making the existing cache is probably the wrong word again but the existing um, stores of arctic related data and making those more accessible to more people um, both in communities where they would be relevant and um, if we're talking capacity building um, it, it would make every student that's starting to work in arctic science a lot happier to be able to actually find the data that they're trying to work with so of spending the first year and a half of their dissertation tracking down who has what um, and so the the that was kind of the primary takeaway. There were a lot of discussions that were still distilling through um, after the observing summit, everyone and myself included kind of scattered. Um, and so we're just getting back to the 20 pages of notes to really boil things down at this point. Um, but Hayo, I know you're on the call. If you want to add anything to my summary, please feel free to do so. Great, thank you, Alice. I'll assume um, Haya will add later if he'd like to. Um, okay, we'll wrap up with um, Shannon Christofferson, who's with the Arctic Institute of North America at University of Cal Calgary. And um, Shannon, uh, thankfully, was one of the rapporteurs for uh, Working Group 4 that focused on data management. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you well. Okay, I don't have a screen share, so I'm going to talk and I'll talk quickly so you don't have to look at my little black token for too long. Um, so our group was the data sub theme working group and we had about a dozen people in that group and a lot of them are members of the Arctic data community who have been working together for some time. And so our group approach was to build on existing work developed during previous meetings, most recently the Polar Data Planning Summit which was held in Colorado in May. Um, we were also building on policy frameworks such as the IASC data statement, the GEO data sharing principles, and the principle called FAIR, which is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data. Um, we found that there was a clear need to network to ensure that all data is findable and visible among the different infrastructures that hold data. And we were looking at a federated search to link catalogs appropriate and robust metadata so that all the data is properly described, uh, shared standards across different interest, infra, infrastructures, sorry, and persistent data identifiers across catalogs to show harvesting. And these were all noted as steps to develop fair data for a connected international cyber infrastructure. We also found a need to ensure ethical open access, which we've known for quite a long time actually, with specific consideration for indigenous knowledge and that partnership with indigenous right holders will be integral to bringing this, into, this data into the international community. Uh, we need to ensure that data continuity is preserved, including data rescue, and that government commitment to ensuring data and information preservation in perpetuity is, um, is supported. And we wanted to note that it, that can't be entirely left to corporations like Google because they don't necessarily have a business incentive to keep data alive if it is maybe just for government use or it's got no real cash for them. Our summary findings were that data were a central element in the science and understanding of the Arctic and if data is not findable and accessible the foundation of this understanding is broken and that using a structured approach, user-driven design, and coordinated international collaboration, we will enhance and connect our existing systems to build an integrated cyber infrastructure that will be the foundation of understanding for solving various use cases. Um, now, our group was actually asked to create a deliverable for the Arctic Science Ministerial that's going to be coming up. And what our group came up with was that we wanted to develop an architecture for an international and interconnected Arctic data system. And we determined that the Arctic data community will work together to provide what is essentially a blueprint for data architecture that will enhance and better connect existing data resources to build a system supporting knowledge integration and analysis appropriate for a wide range of different users. 
This will include improving the mechanisms and resources needed to ensure that Indigenous perspectives are included and Indigenous knowledge is ethically and appropriately utilized. And this deliverable will be developed through a series of international working design and development meetings that build on a series of recent successful workshops like the one I noted at the beginning of this little talk. And that's pretty much a quick summary. Great, thank you very much, Shannon. So that completes our readouts and we are now um, in a position where we can take it into discussion on any of the, the readouts or any topics uh, related to the, to the Arctic Observing Summit, whether you attended or were not able to attend and just want to learn some more. Um, so with that, I'd ask you uh, not to be shy and to come up with some questions for our speakers or others on the, on the call. Okay, I'll, um, I'll start. This is um, Will Ambrose. I'm interested in, um, in the, the Group 2 uh, report, um, and I'm, I'm wondering, and I realize the re report and the readout hasn't been presented yet, but um, Alice, some of what you ground you went over is, is material that um, has been in the wind since the Observing Summit two years ago in Fairbanks, um, and has actually been the topic of discussion um, in the intervening period, and there are um, international groups actually working on just those issues. For example, um, Interos, um, a um, EU-funded project and uh, PolarNet. Um, were those representatives there? Um, that, that's sort of an, an aside, but I'm, I'm more interested in sort of what's the plan? Because, I mean, there's no doubt that we need a gap analysis. There's no doubt that we need an inventory. And these other groups are actually working on that. So um, to the extent that they are, was there discussion of, of integrating um, their efforts, um, because from your readout, and I don't mean to be critical, but I will, um, I, I don't see that that has moved um, the discussion very far forward from where we have been over the last two years. Yes, there, there were representatives from Interos, EU PolarNet, um, and others who have been working on similar, similar approaches. Um, there's somebody, I'm forgetting her name at the moment, um, but it was from NOAA uh, and, and had been involved in a big project that it was identifying data availability within the US um, and with, within kind of the data, NOAA system. Um, and so the, these were actually some of the leading voices in the uh, push to make something happen at a more international scale. Um, so Interos is, is a very big project, so it's very international, but it is still EU focused. Um, and it's a little bit limited in terms of the scope in t of uh, what types of things it's considering. It's very much focused on the um, uh, on the uh, station data and, and other kind of, it, it, there are, just to say that there are some limits to Interos's scope. Um, and so the, the, what was discussed um, at this working group meeting, and I will say this, that it was the last 20 minutes of our discussion, and so things were a little bit rushed at that point, um, and we haven't been able to get everyone back on a call since then, um, was the possibility of giving this as a task to say on, recognizing that they would need to have the funding um, to be able to support the man hours to actually get this done. Um, but to be able to kind of integrate some of these international efforts into a more coherent global approach, recognizing that it is such an international um, world that we're working in, that we do really have to do this from an international perspective. Okay, good. So there was some sort of plan. I'll say, um, putting on my Seon hat, that this has been discussed at, at Seon, and I think we reached the same conclusions that you did, was that it's a, a huge task, uh, which would require, you know, significant funding in the terms of, um, you know, FTEs to actually accomplish that. So I, you know, I wasn't really expecting to see a solution here. Um, and it, it certainly sounds like you, you know, you, you, you've got a plan, but I, I get frustrated because we have identified this as a problem, you know, for several years and um, I, I don't see it moving forward. And it sort of was in Seance Court and then we kind of, you know, kicked it out of there. And um, it was sort of one of the foci of the Arctic Ministerial, the last one. and um, and I, I, I don't, other than these efforts by Upolonet and Interos, um, which as you point out are, you know, limited in, in scope to some extent, I, I don't see a concerted effort to solving a problem which has been recognized for a couple of years, at least. 
Yeah, I think it's definitely an ongoing issue is identifying who and what is in a position to be able to start implementing a solution. Um, I think there's there's no limit to how much scientists can talk to each other about how this needs to be done. Um, but figuring out actually what the mechanism to make it happen is, is I think the, the keystone issue at this point. Right, so I guess, so I'll, I'll just I'll, I'll say, I, you know, I agree with you, and I just was sort of wondering, can you, you know, sum up sort of where the group was in that regard? I mean, is there a, a roadmap? You sort of, maybe you might, you know, suggest that Sam do it, or I mean, you know, where do you think the group is going next? Which I think is is part of what we want to talk about here on this call. Um, this is slightly speculative, but I think the the group is going towards kind of defining, or or at least firming up the description of what exactly needs to happen, and a slightly better idea of of how and what people might go about doing it, um, and then. And then the next step is really identifying who might be in a position to contribute funding to say on to be able to actually hire the people to to get this rolling. Um, I I personally don't know the answer to that question, um, and I know we're going to have another working group called soon. I think possibly next week, um, so we probably will have more answers for you very soon. Um, okay, thanks. Well, I hope you'll yeah. continue to be a you know, a, a contributor to this group um, so that we can, you know, keep up on what's happening there. Yeah. Thanks to both of you. Thanks for the great question, Will, and for the answer. Um, one thing I might add there as well is I, I think it's important just to be looking at connecting various initiatives as, as Will points out. So we, we have the AOS working group, but we also already have a say on committee on observing networks. We have work that's going on under geo and so on. And so, Alice, I'd encourage you to ensure knowing that, that we didn't have full representation in Davos is to work on connecting those um, and, and also with the data community because we have a lot of stuff happening in the data community that in some ways is seen as separate, but as you point out, is really an integral part of the observing system. So, Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think something that AOS can do is lend some weight to backing up Sayon and saying this needs to happen. Exactly. Thanks. Any any other comments or questions for any of our speakers? Say, uh, Peter, if I can just respond to that. And I guess I, I was using the hand tool, which oh, I sorry, I, I wasn't blue, watching for it. A little blue looks like a. <laughs> yeah, I, I my, know it. I just I wasn't my, uh, attention. corner there. Um, no, th that was a great conversation. I, I actually, you know, Alice, you you um, I, I appreciated hearing from you the summary, but and I, I can't really add much substance, but, but since Will brought this up, I, I think this is an important forum to discuss it. The, 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 there's three things I, I'd like to sort of add or add additional momentum to what Alice said. And that is one, Intaros and PolarNet were involved in a series of working group meetings prior to the summit. And, and one of the things that emerged was that Intaros was actually looking for the summit to provide help in broadening the uh, analysis that they are undertaking in terms of observing assets and capabilities. And, and uh, Roberta Perizzini, who's on this call, with a beautiful background uh, or backdrop of the Swiss Alps, it looks like, um, can say more to that. But my sense is that there's a lot of synergy and that we're starting to see the summit and as a process, as well as SEON and its working groups, work towards the common, a common goal, but using different channels and different connections. That, that's one thing. The second thing is that um, what, what, what is important is that there is large capacity, you know, um, getting back to the great presentation that started this meeting off, there is large capacity for, um, or, or should I say capability, maybe I didn't pay enough attention, but uh, uh, for, um, significant contributions to sustain observing by Asian countries. And we went through, we went out of the way to include China, Korea, uh, and Japan in these conversations. They're actually continuing. Um, two weeks from now, there's gonna be a workshop, mostly focused on cryosphere in China, where this will come up again, to make sure that there's increasing alignment between how these different countries approach exactly those questions that will raise us. The third point is, that the, the, the summary, 
both the both the statement that the Arctic Observing Summit passed on to the Arctic Science Ministerial, as well as the the working group report that Sandy Starkweather, who was co-leading this, and myself and and the working group leadership are going to put together, makes very explicit mention of what is needed, and and it does include much more specific guidance on not just that a roadmap is needed, but what that roadmap might look like, who's going to produce it, and all the way down to the number of FTEs actually that are needed to do this. And, and it's not insignificant. And, and what, what needs to happen now is, is that all of us who are in agreement that this is something that needs to be pursued, um, and, and we'll be sure to share all of these documents as, as soon as they become available, is to inject that at, at whatever level we can into the conversations at the Arctic Science Ministerial. I, you know, I, I, I sort of hear a bit of a frustration there in your comments, Will, which I, I fully understand um, that, well, the Arctic Science Ministerial, okay, what's that really gonna get us? But I do think that in particular for SEON, and, and that was specifically called out, if we, if we play this right, we may have an opportunity to see actual commitment of resources um, to, to this effort that, that Alice so nicely described. Great, thanks so much, Hayo. It was very helpful. Um, Roberta. Yeah, uh, hello. Uh, do you hear me? We can hear you, yes. Yes. Um, if I can add something on behalf of Interos. Uh, um, yeah, so I'm Roberta Pirassini from Finnish Meteorological Institute and I was uh, participating in the working group two in the Arctic Observing Summit. And yes, so, um, what was the Interos contribution? So uh, Interos has now the, um, the resources, or has had the resources to um, do part of the gap analysis and assessment that we were speaking about. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the aim is, although the, the focus was mostly European, but not only European, but mainly European, but the, uh, the um, uh, vision is to involve uh, also the Pan-Arctic uh, players in the assessment, in the gap analysis of the existing uh, observing system in the Arctic. And we have developed the tools, we have uh, created um, uh, uh, an analysis tools to, to, to produce this gap analysis and assessment. And uh, we, we have opened recently questionnaire to, to um, outside interests, so to everybody. And um, well, if I can use this forum, this uh, arena here to advertise a session in the, in the coming um, 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 uh, AGU meeting in Washington, we will have a, a session there uh, on um, actually the title is uh, assessment, announcement, and integration of Arctic observing system. Uh, this session, this session was um, initiated by uh, me and other interest colleagues uh, to present the mainly to present the results of uh, of the interest assessment of the existing observing systems. Um, but um, uh, we are uh, inviting contribution from all those who have uh, components of the Arctic observing system or those who deal with the uh, uh, data collection in the Arctic to present um, assessment description of data and, uh, uh, um, and issue also related to the data management uh, and the um, the sustainability of their observing system. Uh, we have we want to address all aspects of the observing systems in this in this session. We think it's a good forum to discuss about this, and um, we will uh, perhaps discuss next week uh, in uh, further. But uh, um, one idea is also to have a side meeting to continue with the with the um, AOS working group too uh, during the. Uh, Washington um, uh, meeting, the AGU meeting. 
So um, yeah, that's all. Great. Thank you very much, Roberta. I note that uh, Bill Manley has a question or comment. Bill? Hi, uh, this is a very interesting conversation indeed. Uh, I'm with the Arctic Observing Viewer, and uh, I wanted to mention that, you know, um, uh, it seems great that there's growing uh, recognition of the need for gap analysis and mapping and inventory of existing networks and sites. And, and so there are some resources out there already, particularly in Taros, but also the Arctic Observing, observing Viewer. And um, so I'd encourage you all to go there and check it out, arcticobservingviewer.org. And uh, this is an NSF-sponsored uh, activity. Um, and there's uh, over 15,000 observing sites for the Arctic in the application, uh, and something more than 20 networks. And you can get a sense of who's doing what where and where there are gaps and how we can optimize op opportunities with uh, links to data and you know, additional details about what sorts of observations are being made at each site. Um, so we've, uh, we've been in touch a little bit with Intaros, but I can see uh, reaching out to them more. Um, a lot of it comes down to actually deciding on essentially what is a metadata standard for observing sites. Uh, what sorts of details are uh, able to be interoperable among different portals. Um, and um, and uh, we're interested in, in uh, within a somewhat limited budget, working with multiple groups uh, and sharing information. We have multiple web services and getting information together for a comprehensive perspective, uh, kind of an observing system for the Arctic observing system. Thanks very much, Bill. That's a very useful comment. I think something we want to remember, given the urgency and the limited resources that we have, is always making sure we take a look for what exists. Um, I might take an opportunity to, to sort of highlight what Shannon said about Working Group 4, as well as we're looking at trying to develop this architecture. Um, and the idea there is not to reinvent the wheel, if at all possible, but just to look at how to connect the various data systems and identifying those systems. So our next meeting will be in Geneva uh, towards the end of November. We're just about to confirm the dates for that at WMO headquarters. Um, but I think the AGU meeting maybe is a great opportunity for us to get together soon after that to, to really keep that, keep that moving. Um, do we have any other questions? I see Sandy Starkweather is putting up her hand. Sandy. Yeah, from, a, from my grave side here, <laughs> <laughs> yes. thanks for running the call. Uh, Bill used a, an important term that came up a lot in our discussion and I think maybe deserves more attention, and that's schema. Um, as we're looking at, uh, you know, we looked at this mapping exercise, we looked at a lot of the tools that Intaros has also used to try to assess their observing system. Um, another sort of assessment schema is the tool that the, um, the Science and Technology Policy Institute has been using, um, bias more towards the societal benefits area side. And I think what, what we really need right now is um, something like a workshop to bring you know, I, I know we just had the AOS, but the AOS is, is broader and, and hits a different level. I think there's enough people, at least from the Working Group 2 community, who really have their heads wrapped around this right now and understand, yes, inventories are extremely ponderous and labor intensive. Um, you know, it seems like we are going to have a hard time making progress in the community without one. And I think what we really need is a crisp view of exactly what information we're trying to capture and what kinds of questions we're trying to answer with that question. And to me, that's really a design issue. Um, you know, the word schema sort of relates to that design. The other thing that I think became very apparent during our working group two conversation is we need to bring in other types of expertise. So the research community are really the subject matter experts, but they don't spend a lot of time with these kind of systems engineering requirements flow down um, type of tools. 
And so I think, you know, Nikki Branson's on the phone. Uh, Hank Losher has spent a lot of time and has a lot of experience with these. Um, the Science and Technology Policy Institute has a lot of experience with these. What we really need to do, I think, in our next step is make sure we have enough of that expertise in the room um, and that the, the research community can, can play more the role of subject matter experts saying, here's what some of the complexities are to help inform a more design-oriented process. Thank you, Sandy. I think that's, that's great as well. And Bill touched on this, I think, through his comments, but I would also suggest that we are probably talking about schemas or schemata um, in that, um, you know, we have, we have a lot of work that's been done in the data world with, you know, metadata and so on, but Bill touched on the idea of, you know, site metadata or observing system metadata. So how do we actually describe the observing assets, you know, some work they've done there, et cetera. And as you point out, you know, how do we take that to the next level? So I think that's a, a great thought. Um, do we have in our closing minutes any other, maybe a last comment or question? Okay. Um, one very brief comment I would make is, is it you know, came up a lot in our data discussions, um, not only at AOS, but many other meetings as well as this, um, need and, and I think uh, important aspect of it is connecting this outside of the Arctic observing community. So particularly with data, you know, establishing these, these schemas and establishing interoperability and all that is not limited to the polar regions or the Arctic region. Um, these are global discussions that are happening um, across research, across governments and so on. And so making sure that in those experts Sandy's refer, refers to, that we're engaging those, those global initiatives um, so that we don't create you know, a silo that we then have to engineer. How do we connect the, those schemas into the global system? Um, so we, we happily had a lot of participation at AOS um, from groups like GEO and Research Data Alliance and so on. So I think we're well on our way to that, but something maybe just to remember. Yeah, Peter, if I could make one comment too. Um, sure. Even though she appears to be near death, um, you know, Sandy makes a good point, and it's something that the three or four of us talked about on a on a pre meeting call um, about you know trying to pull some of this together in a workshop or or perhaps a larger um, funded effort. And so we're certainly not going to solve that today, and, and possibly not even in the next you know uh, three, four, five, six months. But I, I you know I I think this may be a a theme of this of this group and also the the data group. So I would encourage the 30 plus people on this call um, to continue to contribute to this group and to push forward some of the ideas that, that, that Sandy mentioned there. And perhaps we can coalesce around, you know, some sort of effort, whether it's a workshop or whether it's an uh, RCN from NSF or whether it's, you know, something else um, or whether we decide that's not the way to go at all and there's another way to go. But, you know, I don't want to sort of lose the, the good discussion we've had here today and that was also preceded by the discussion that three or four of us had. Um, as we go forward, I hope that the people who, some of who are new to, these, uh, to this call, um, will continue to ring in and, and we can move this forward. Great, thanks Bill. And I, I'm just reading the chat here as well and George Kling I think makes a really important point as well about um, engaging funding agencies and the continuity and this certainly came up at AOS is how do we create something that's sustainable, not simply sporadic you know, workshops and so on as, as important as they are. Um, so we'll we'll record this comment that that you've made, George, and include that in the minutes, because I think it's it's critical in thinking about how do we create a sustainable system, and one that that we can keep following up on and and keep the design alive. So, um, with that, I am going to bring our meeting to a close. Um, I'll just 